be here with you all. Um, so I come from a magazine which tries to understand the future. I spent a lot of my time in the last year, 130 flights, meeting the entrepreneurs, the investors, the researchers in the universities, trying to work out how business, our behavior, the way we interact is going to change. And I'm going to argue in the next 15 minutes that technology is going to be more significant in the luxury travel world over, let's say, the next five years because of this. The exponential curve. You've heard of Moore's Law. Stuff that was expensive goes to zero. This is the price of computer storage, but we know it's happening with computer processing. But it's not just happening with IT. The same trend is hitting all sorts of things. It's hitting the falling cost of sequencing DNA. This is a logarithmic scale. 15 years ago, $100 million, now a couple hundred dollars. This is going to change medicine. It's hitting the falling cost of solar energy. This year, in many countries, solar energy suddenly became much cheaper than conventional fossil energy. What's this going to mean for how we fly? What kind of transport we use? It's going to change all sorts of things. I met Bertrand Picard, the Swiss adventurer, um, six or seven years ago, and he said, I'm going to fly a plane around the world without using any fuel. I'm going to do it by solar power. And people dismissed Bertrand Picard. But then that exponential curve hit. Solar panels became cheaper, more powerful, more effective. And then a year and a bit ago, he flies his solar impulse, solar powered plane around the world. So I'm noticing these exponential curves everywhere. Because when you network the world with billions of mobile devices, you create new exponentials, which create new business opportunities if you're fast enough. This is Brian Chesky, co-founder of Airbnb. It's a very nice exponential curve for Airbnb. This is the number of guests staying on New Year's Eve since 2009. He didn't have some magic secret. He was just at the right moment on that curve. And these inflection curves are going to change human behavior. They're already crazy inflection curves. This is the currency that doesn't have a central bank. This is the price of Bitcoin, which exceeded $11,000 a few days ago. It was $1,000 at the beginning of the week, at the beginning of the year. It may be right back down by the time I get off stage. But suddenly, we have something which is distributed. And it's tech that has enabled this. So I'm going to talk a bit about where I see all this change hitting the luxury world, the travel world, but mostly how we expect to connect with each other, with services, with businesses. Because the future comes more quickly than we realize. Now, we're all starting to get very used to talking to the network. Forget computer mouse, forget even swipe screen. This is all of a sudden the default way we're talking, well, increasingly to our car, to our bedroom, to our entertainment system. But it was barely 20 years ago that Microsoft launched a project to try and teach the network to recognize the human voice. In 1994, they launched a very ambitious project. And the first year, it was a complete failure. They couldn't get anything recognized. But because of that exponential curve, by 2013, they said it was 23%. Not quite there, but getting better. Earlier this year, they said they had reached human parity. That means something that was sci-fi that wasn't possible becomes possible. You can have a bit of fun. You can put a couple of these devices together, two Google Home devices, and have them have a conversation with each other. Somebody actually did this, put about eight hours of this on YouTube, two of these devices starting to have a philosophical discussion with each other. I'm sorry. What was your question again? What do you think is the meaning of your life? That there is no meaning. 
Then why do we continue to live? Because we are selfish. I'm happy to leave this running for a few hours. They have a marital argument about hour four. So with all this happening, I'm an optimist about tech, and I'm going to give you five quick reasons why I think, if you're not scared of them, if you see a utility for them, these technologies could be very useful for business. And the first of them is this idea of distance is being challenged by technologies, not just the Hyperloop, but the Hyperloop is just one example of a few motivated people with quite a lot of wealth who have got together and said, let's try and create something that changes our assumptions of moving people over distances. Now, I'm not quite sure how comfortable the ride is going to be sucked through a vacuum tube at 700 miles an hour, but just because we're not used to it doesn't mean we should be dismissing it. And then Elon Musk, who's managed to create a pretty exciting private space business, a couple of months ago, starts saying, well, why don't we use our space rockets to help people get to the other side of the world in half an hour? London to Sydney, maybe in an hour. Now, I always correlate Elon Musk's very cool videos with his urgent need for finance for his car business, but he's a man with charisma. He builds teams of very impressive engineers. Who says he can't do it? But distance is being challenged not by big things with powerful engines, but by our perception of distance. So there's now a whole bunch of new augmented reality, virtual reality devices. This is Microsoft's version, HoloLens, using holograms. So the gentleman on the left isn't physically in the room, but you can feel as if he is. So what does this mean where our perceptions are so challenged like this? There's even a way of you know, having a miniaturized friend, your daughter, come to visit you. What does this mean for the experience of travel? What does this mean for maybe being in the VIP suite of that concert, of that Las Vegas show, where you can actually feel you are next to the people before me? It's going to create new kind of expectations. Virtual reality, where you wear the goggles, you have 360 degree field of view, creates a new level of empathy. You feel you're there. This is a filmmaker called Chris Milk, who filmed a refugee camp, Syrian 12-year-olds living in Jordan, and you're there with them. Imagine this is surrounding you. You are at that football match with them. At the same time, we're going to get used to automation hitting all sorts of sectors, but I think we can use robots for constructive ways. So we're already starting to see robots as service assistants in hospitality, but I think this is a very, very, very granular part of what the future portends. The robots that take us exactly where we want. So the flying car is now a reality. There's a bunch of businesses. This is a German company called Lilium, raised $90 million earlier this year. That's Daniel, the founder. Electric vertical takeoff jets. And it's not the only company. There's another German company called Volocopter, that's coming to market within the next year for 300,000 euros with these. And maybe it doesn't look like refined luxury travel, but when you've got startups working on increasingly agile ways to get people around, they'll be more and more comfortable, there'll be different price points, the rules change. So the autonomous car is coming closer, it will park itself it will allow you to live further away because you'll be able to work or sleep or play games because you won't need to steer. Because the new technology is LiDAR. The laser that sees what's going on around the car has infinite amount more information than we as humans. It's hard to acknowledge it, but these will be better drivers than us. These will 
save lives, even though at first it's going to seem really strange. Oh, there's cars coming! Oh, oh, there's cars! Bill, just put me back for me control. It's a guy called Bill Rimmer who put his mum in his Tesla set to autonomous mode. Next time it will be normal. First time hard. This links to artificial intelligence, which is going to go from the lab to everywhere. And the AI is now really good at doing a lot of things humans can do. It can see, it can recognize sound. The artificial intelligence network, the deep learning network, just by studying her eyes, is able to figure out what direction she's gazing. Maybe she's um, looking at, uh oh, no, shouldn't do that. Okay, so that's called gaze tracking. And this next one is really cool. This is inspired by, this is lip reading. Take me to Starbucks. So that's the chip company NVIDIA at the Consumer Electronics Show earlier this year. Some researchers at Stanford earlier this year took a video feed, bottom left, got a guy making faces at a webcam and combined them, and you wouldn't know the difference. Here we show a close-up of the footage from the previous live reenactment. The input video stream is shown on the left. Note that the target actor is re-rendered in a neutral pose. On More fun when you actually get a different American president. So, you know, the whole idea of fake news, when you can actually create videos that seem what they're not. So AI is coming. It's doing all sorts of things. There's AIs being put on boards. There's even an Amazon store of the future, Amazon Go, the AI that knows when you're taking something off the shelf, bills you afterwards, there's no shop assistance. But the AI is now getting really good at understanding people's emotion. This is a Dutch startup called Sitecore that scans a crowd, knows in real time the percentage for each person of sadness, anger, disgust, despair. You will be able to understand the emotion of everybody coming into your building, up into your venue. This is a New Zealand company that can read emotion and have you talk to avatars. These are CGI, these are not videos of people. They set up a webcam, microphones. I don't understand. Yes. No. No. Maybe. It's called Soul Machines, this company. They're using it for hospitals to talk to patients. And it works in different languages. So connected with that, we're also getting better at starting to understand the brain. So there's a bunch of initiatives over the next 10 years, I think, will help to understand our thoughts and connect them to the network. Elon has a business called Neuralink. He's trying to read the electrical signals. This is another guy, Brian Johnson. He set up a finance company, sold it to PayPal for 800 million. He's, sent, he's spending 100 million on a new project called Kernel, where he's getting some of the best experts in the world trying to read the, the brain's signals. And finally, we talk about reality, but I want to introduce you to post-reality, which is how especially millennials are living. Post-reality is when you shave your eyebrows and paint on new eyebrows because it looks better on Instagram. Post-reality is where you don't follow your instincts, you follow the sat-nav. And behavior is not rational. Somebody posted on the chat forum Reddit two years ago a question. If somebody from the 1950s was to come back, what would be the hardest thing to explain to them about modern life? And my favorite answer was, I've got a device in my pocket capable of accessing the entirety of information known to man, and I use it to look at pictures of cats and get into arguments with strangers. So for all this tech, your customers are increasingly irrational. We've had to redraw Maslow's hierarchy of human needs for this new world. So think of what these virtual reality opportunities are going to create for these newly irrational people. This is Magic Leap. <laughs> Company funded for $2 billion to create some kind of visual illusions. No product yet, but they're really good at making hype videos. There are entertainments that are possible now with these devices. This is The Void. You spend 30 dollars for a 10-minute experience where you're on the set shooting ghosts on Ghostbusters, but you feel you're there and you could be in a shed. So, to conclude, the world's never going to move this slowly again. We are in a world where, yes, there are big 
expensive investments in robots, but innovation comes from the edge. The people behind the Vespa motorbike, Piaggio, earlier this year released the robot suitcase that supposedly follows you around. So I'm going to leave you with, actually, some optimism. We think the robot is going to take away the human value. It's going to take away our work. I'm going to argue that humans are going to survive. We can do things the robots can't yet do. We have creativity. We have passion. We understand what our customers want. Humans for the win. Thank you.